Good afternoon. This is the Board of County Commissioners Board Work Session. This is a regular meeting. It is Wednesday, January 11th, 2023. It is 2.13 p.m. Uh, we, this is a hybrid meeting. We're in the atrium, 3000 Pacific Avenue, Southeast, room 110. For public virtual attendance, you may follow along on, Thurs on the Thurston County YouTube channel. I'm Carolina Mejia. I'm the chair of the board. To my right is Vice Chair Ty Menser. To my left is Commissioner Gary Edwards. Also in the boardroom, we have our County Manager, Ramiro Chavez, as well as our Assistant County Manager, Robin Campbell. And we also have a guest today. Uh, we're gonna be discussing the Lot Clean Water Alliance planning for the future briefing. And so with that, I'm gonna pass it to you if you'll introduce yourself and- Thank you so much for having me, especially in this beautiful new space. Uh, my name is Matt Canelli. I am the executive director of Lot Clean Water Alliance. And today, uh, I'd like to tell you about uh, our, our planning for the future. So essentially our 2050 master plan that we recently completed. And we're just starting to roll this out, primarily first to partner jurisdictions of Lot, and then we'll start going out further to the public. So I've got a presentation here to walk you through that master planning process, and then I can Take any questions, but certainly stop me along the way if you have any. So I like to show this screen just as an overview. I think all of you know what LOT is, but sometimes you know, people are watching, they're, they're unfamiliar with LOT, Lacey, Olympia, Tumwater, and Thurston County. So the LOT partnership was started in the 1970s as a way of you know, doing wholesale wastewater treatment as a community. And really, the lot that you see today was formed around 2000 as a result of an interlocal agreement. Um, and that's what we're operating under today. So uh, you can see the picture of the four board members. So one elected official from each of the partner jurisdictions. Uh, Commissioner Menser is, has been acting as our, our vice president. Um, oh, the, for the, for the, is that me? <laughs> no. Four years of commissioning can do. Look at my hair. Yeah. <laughs> I'll update that photo. Yes. <laughs> Me too. I had good no. hair back then. <laughs> True. I don't want to keep that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so we're the regional wastewater utility. So, our mission is to conserve and protect uh, public health and the environment by cleaning and restoring water resources. And how we do that is primarily at our main treatment plant in downtown Olympia at the Bud Inlet Treatment Plant. We process about 13 million gallons per day. And I just tried to put together some numbers recently to try to give a perspective of what 13 million gallons per day really is. So if you took a football field and you built a four-story building on it, the whole length, and you filled it all with water, that's 13 million gallons per day. Um, so just to give you that amount of water on average is coming down in a, in a, in a state that would hurt the environment, would hurt public health, and that's our job, is to clean that up and protect that public health and uh, restore that to the environment. So we discharge uh, that treated flow to Bud, in to Bud Inlet. So it has the most strict uh, water quality standards for us in our region and, and our treatment plant. We, have, we operate under the most strict uh, wastewater permit. And uh, we've been doing that for quite some time. And we're proud of the work that we do. Matt, is that kind of for the Puget Sound? Is that what you're referring to in our area? Right. So our treatment plan, our community has the strictest standards of any treatment plan on Puget Sound. Okay. And why? Why do we get hammered with the strictest standards? <clears throat> so it's driven by water quality. The Department of Ecology is focused on primarily Bud Inlet over time, doing a series of studies, and over decades, actually. So the total maximum daily load, the TMDL, was recently put out by Ecology. So that work has, had been going on for a long time, and we were planning for it. But now recently, they, they said you're capped on the amount of nitrogen that you discharge. So uh, is that kind of it's an impaired water body under the Ecology program. Is that, is that something we did wrong as a community over time, or is it a function of the hydrology of being kind of at the they talk, you know, they talk about us being like a bath shop sure. or something at the bottom of Puget Sound. Is it is it kind of inevitable because of where we are, or did we create that situation somehow that has now put us on these caps? And so the answer is both, and I can't give you the direct split, but inherently, by being at the bottom of Puget Sound, we are, you know, we we get what comes down from the north. We're just a limited flushing situation happening in Butt Inlet, and then there's the the people factor that, you know, do have an impact to that already situation. 
So the wastewater resource management plan really set into motion. This was this was put into place in the late '90s with a lot of public input. Um, that set into motion what that interlocal agreement was put together by the partner jurisdictions that created the lot you see today. So uh, public values were put together, treating wastewater as a resource, ma responsibly managing growth uh, into the future, uh, and and the jurisdictions actually you know control that growth, lot just response to it. Uh, we want to maximize benefits to the environment and also look for community benefits. So you see from some of our projects we put together, we really try to look at seeing where there's a community benefit. Uh, in Tumwater, for example, when the tank, the, the million gallon storage tank was built, the city of Tumwater came and put a park on top of it. So that's a good example of kind of that cross, cross benefit to the community. So the original management strategies that the plan put together are very much uh, in practice today and have, have served us well. That's one of them is flow reduction. If you can get flow out of the system before it actually gets to lot, it's less we have to treat, it's less staff, it's less infrastructure, all of those things. So there's a water conservation program put into place in 1997. Uh, continued discharge to Bud Inlet was part of that original plan and some studies went into confirming that that could continue to occur. Reclaimed water came out of this plan, so producing reclaimed water, using it for irrigation, having that beneficial product. But what that original plan said was, let's have these decentralized treatment plants around the county. So, for example, the Martin Way Reclaimed Water Plant in Lacey is one of those decentralized plants. But the original plan envisioned multiple other plants where you would produce reclaimed water and do groundwater infiltration. So a lot at the time went, went about purchasing properties that would be future plants, future infiltration sites. So we own properties today for what would be the future. When, when you talk about uh, groundwater infiltration, that's uh, so you don't have to run it through uh, your system out into this Puget Sound, out into the salt water. And then what, Mother Nature takes care of it from there and kind of filters it more and more and more and more until it reaches wherever. Right, so this is reclaimed water that's being infiltrated. So this is an additional step of treatment even beyond the, the Bud Inlet treatment plant that would go into Puget Sound. So it's turned into reclaimed water and then goes through wetlands to do further treatment and then it goes into groundwater infiltration. And that soil water interaction does get further breakdown of Whatever is that an injection be. system with the pump? No, it's just surface percolation. Okay. It just kind of passively goes on the surface. And the site that we do that in is, is our Hawks Prairie site, mm -hmm. and that was chosen because of that high percolation rate that, 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 and the ground could take it. So, so reclaim water, like compared to what gets discharged to Bud Inlet, there's really two more levels of protection, right? There's the extra treatment step that you refer to, and then there's the fact that it's being, um, it's going through. Correct, that soil uh, water and Percolation, I know you I've learned about three different processes that happened, uh, yeah. but there's kind of those two extra layers versus what we discharge directly into Bud Inlet. That's correct. And then before you leave this slide, mm -hmm. you know Mike used to always talk about the highly managed plan. Right. And and I'm assuming that these are the elements on this slide that kind of are in that plan. And what, what was the, what's the reason for that name, the highly managed, what's highly managed about it versus right. any other kind of plan that right. you might have had? So the highly managed plan is this, this last build, this continuous planning approach. So what we do at lot, what our community does uh, out of this original planning process was we do this annual planning approach. So every year we're looking at growth, we're looking at our processes, we're looking at our capacity and then we're determining when we need to build projects in the future. What some other locations do, the, the larger counties, say up north, or other, other places, most other places, is they do a sewerage plan and they look out 20 years, they might build a treatment plant and then they grow into it. So we don't do that in our community. We're actually constantly just looking out. Well, you know, we look out long term, but we're updating our numbers every year. So we spend more time in planning, but by doing that, we can take advantage of technology, uh, we can defer some projects as I can tell you growth has not occurred at the rate that the original plan had said that we would be at. We're actually lower. So had we built this big plant to grow into it, it would have been a stranded investment. So that's, that's why you get to the highly managed plan 
name. Is that care? And is that I know ju isn't just in time kind of a just in time planning is another term that was used a lot. And that connects to this right. Okay. Right. And so you're just you're still doing proper planning, but you're just waiting to pull the trigger when when the time is right. Matt, is is it is stormwater go through as well as uh, the sewers and stuff? Some does. So there's still combined sewers in downtown Olympia and some close by neighborhoods. The city of Olympia went through about an eight and a half million dollar effort in the early 2000s to separate a lot of those. And that was part of that original interlocal agreement that the city of Olympia would do this big construction effort to remove as much as could that made sense at the time. So by fulfilling that obligation, then the remaining combined sewers efforts, then lot treats that. And, and the original plant was built to handle that. So we do, when we have rain events, sometimes flows could get from that 13 million gallons per day number I said, we can get up to about 65. 65 million? Yeah. That you treat? Oh yeah, in a single day. It's rocking and rolling for sure when that amount of flow is coming down there. But that's instantaneous and that kind of peaks, peaks yeah. and wanes and we're built to handle it. Um, the separation of those uh, sewers, those combined sewers, you know, constantly gets looked at whether or not that is an effective investment. And when you separate sewers, you also need to build stormwater treatment facilities as well. So there's an additional treatment you wouldn't even need even if you separated it. So yeah, some combined sewers to answer your question. When do they test your nitrogen level? Because we've got the highest requirement, I guess, because of nitrogen. Right. Uh, they must not check during the 60 million process. They just check during the we have, 14 well, million. Well, it depends. Or? We have daily sampling requirements. So if we're having a rain event, we sample that day. It's very diluted at that time. So uh, the concentration So is that less. might even be better, the heavy concentration. Yeah, so we're, we are capped on the uh, total maximum pounds that you can have, the pounds of nitrogen at the end of that given month. So all of that concentration kind of adds up to a, to a limit at the end of the month that we can discharge. We report, we have to report that. Right? We report that to the Department of Ecology. We have our own lab, we they send out samples. In. Yeah, we, we do the, all the self-reporting. Uh, sometimes ecology might come down to do specific testing, uh, but we, we do our own self-reporting and our, our operators have to be certified in that. And I will get an sign email off like saying, you know, Board will get an email saying, oh, we exceeded permit. You know, it's happened once or twice and the whole time I've been on the board and right. it's an explanation for it, you know, just because of a, a blip in time. I remember we had a slug load of some kind of oily thing and it created. Yeah. Yeah. When you operate at such low levels of treatment that we do, when, when changes happen where somebody dumps something in the system and then it hits our process, the biology that does the treatment gets a little out of whack, you know, and so it takes a little bit to recover and we've got some great folks working on that. But yeah, sometimes that can happen. It's it's rare, but it can. It, and similar happened in maybe Robin is the one who'd remember when the uh, great wall were great wolf lodge switches switch valves and then unloaded swimming pool water. Yep. It almost killed. Because of the bleach? Yeah, it almost killed our plant. The yeah. biologic, I mean, we yeah. had to stop. We had to start tracking all the sewage until yeah. we can uh, really replant. Oh, it yeah. was it was it brutal. Was so I know exactly what yeah. the, the We've had things that. that are, you know, it was uh, bright green wastewater was coming down to us for a while. So it's like, where's the green coming from? And it turned out somebody had dumped something at a car wash and... and the green dye was coming down and it wasn't affecting our process, but it was suspicious. And we have people that go out in the system and right. do investigations. So, yeah. Um, so onto the, just to, to hit those kind of three major topics of, of what we've done since that original plan, and they're still very valid, is that flow reduction has saved 1.3 million gallons per day, 1.3 million gallons uh, since 1997. So it's something we'll continue to do, these low flow toilet vouchers. Um, it's really kind of hitting its limit from a major saving standpoint because building codes have changed to the point that it's already putting in a lot of these low flow devices. Um, but we're, we're gonna continue to message water conservation through our wet science center, 
as well as our school programs and just, you know, continuing to that. But as far as what's driving our capacity to support future growth at lot, it's actually the nutrient load, the nitrogen load that's coming to us as opposed to all of this flow. Except, you know, the peak flows and the rain events does drive us. You but know, mostly it's the nutrients. Um, when you mentioned nitrogen <laughs> load, uh, I don't know if you're aware of this, but, you know, commercial uh, tree farms use a lot of nitrogen. They put it on with helicopters. and The fertilizer? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. and it, it's a certain prescription. I don't think uh, urea, I don't know what it is. It's some kind of urea okay. product. Anyway, I tried to get the state, when they did their analysis of the river, to do the whole river, they, but they chose just to do the lower river. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know what that would equate out to, but I'm kind of curious when it get, talks about groundwater, what your nitrogen level is where you're infiltrating up at Hawks Prairie. So before you put it into the pond, because a certain amount of it, I guess, get, is taken out by the pond, biology of the pond maybe, but so is that pretty high nitrogen water at that point or not? Or? No, it's, I mean, it's, uh, relatively speaking, it's pretty low. It's um, our permit uh, required. Well, the way that we have it is about less than five milligrams per liter. So it's, it's low nitrogen. It's still more than nothing, right? But uh, as far as a high nitrogen load to the ground, our studies out there has confirmed that that's not contributing okay. to that. Yeah. But certainly all of those sources of nitrogen in our environment um, impact water quality. So the, the next one is butt inlet discharge. I mentioned we have the most strict standards, but we meet that uh, really well. So we have it, the, the threshold is very low, and the way that we manage capacity is actually by treating to even lower standards. That way we can ride out any buffers, things that happen that gets kind of flushed down into our system. Um, new growth comes in, and we've got some buffer capacity. So we're, we're, we're proud of the work that we do. Uh, and we have a whole process control teams. We have a lot of folks working on looking at microbiology and everything. We recently went through an upgrade, $29 million upgrade, cover biological process improvements project. And now we're getting some of the best treatment in, in the country when we check in with our consultants working elsewhere for the type of treatment that we do at lot. So that is a way that we can manage capacity is continue to treat the, to very low, low levels uh, below, what's, below what's regulated on us. How we do a reclaim water production is at two places. So it's the bud inlet plant itself. We have a separate treatment plant called a bud inlet reclaim water plant. And then we have our Martin Way reclaim water plant that's out in Lacey. Uh, both are one and a half million gallons per day. That's MGD. And so the Martin Way reclaim water plant goes to the Hawks Prairie site that we've been talking about for groundwater infiltration. The one at Bud Inlet. Uh, sends water primarily to like the Port of Olympia, um, the Hands on Children Museum, that the stream in front of there, that's what lot operates. But also the Tumwater Golf Course is a huge user of that. 600,000 gallons per day of reclaimed water is used there in the summer, which is a drop for drop offset of what potable water would be needed at that site. Out at Hawks Prairie, when the water is produced at our reclaimed water plant out there, this is, these are the ponds that I, that I mentioned out here that, so after the water, the reclaimed water is treated to that additional standard, it actually gets further polishing in these ponds. And then these are the infiltration basins right here, just open surface infiltration basins. This is a good example of that community benefit where this is used by Audubon Society and people walk their dogs out there and it's it's really matured over time and almost is somewhat of an oasis out there when you look at all the warehouses and things that have been built up out there. Because, it, of, because of the type of soils there, do you have to slow down the filtration rate? No. no. So you have, a, the, the, the soils gives you enough velocity for infiltration. Right, yeah, they're technically defined as rapid infiltration basins, so we want that soil to be uh, fast fast infiltration, yeah. Um, and then the city of Olympia and Lacey also have taken that water off of that line earlier before this site, and they use it for groundwater uh, uh, infiltration to get municipal water rights as, as an offset there. So that's probably a good model for the future. So the reason why we did this master planning effort and looking out through 2050 is because 
growth looks different now than it did was envisioned in the late 90s. I mean, we just have updated numbers, but the amount of data that we can leverage now is just a lot better. We look down with the TRPC data down by to the parcel level itself and what that parcel will is zoned at, what it could develop to, look at wastewater generation rates like per person. So we can project out for the future what growth is going to look like. Um, we can now take advantage of some lessons learned. We're op we've been operating our Martin Way reclaimed water plant for a while, so we know what it takes to operate a decentralized facility. We have new technologies that have come on the market to allow us to leverage those. We have a testing program a lot um, that we run. We know permit regulations now and what that would look like. We have some new regulations on us as well as overall in Puget Sound. The Puget Sound Nutrient General Permit is what that is. And just with climate and weather events, more intense storms, uh, we had to move up the timeline of upgrade of some of our pumps uh, to be able to move that flow through the plant. And also in collaboration with the City of Olympia and the port on uh, sea level rise. So taking the reclaimed water to, to the Hot Spray area, how many lift stations do you have? Uh, the reclaimed water to Hawkesbury site is just directly pumped from our plant. So all the way you only there. have one? Okay. Yeah. So we don't have any pump stations. Wastewater pump stations, we have three major wastewater pump stations, but reclaimed water, all the water that's produced is actually pumped from the facility. Oh, What's right. the change in elevation? Do you know? Like 150 feet or what? That's probably you know, under, I have, yeah. You have I have to look, that's there, probably huh? about right. Yeah. Yeah, Boy, that's good. quite a lift. That must put some pressure on those pipes, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, you know, Accessible it's designed pipe. at, you know, standards for velocities yeah, and pressures sure. yeah. and all of that. So um, How big of a line do you have going up there? Like a two-foot line or something or what? No, I, I let me see the line size. It's probably a 24 or 30-inch diameter line. Yeah, because pressurized, you go yeah. a smaller size. Yeah, line. yeah. Yeah. Uh, so then, so then, so we, so this 2050 master planning process, we did it in three phases. We're here in phase three, we're rolling this out. But the first thing we did was look at our site plan for the butt-inlet treatment plant. All the things that we need to do to upgrade our main treatment facility over time. Then we did phase two, which looked at our overall capacity. Because the original plan said, our original long-range plan, that wastewater resource management plan said, okay, when our community grows, just produce more reclaimed water. And and continue to send flow to Bud Inlet, but produce reclaimed water and just get that flow out of Bud Inlet. That's how the preservation of capacity was, was set into motion. So we evaluated that, and I'll explain more later. But first on to the, to the Bud Inlet treatment plant, we went through every single process and said, what needs to be upgraded, what the pumps, um, all these different treatment processes that, that it takes to, to take that really broken product and, and you know, create it to make it clean again. Uh, so we went through all that and we came up with a site plan that uh, has a flexible approach for the future. The takeaways outside of all the, all the, the numbers and plan that we use internally is really that for the most part, we can use our existing site, but it's pretty hemmed in there. So we did need to look at if we need to expand, where would we expand? And so there's a, there's a site right across the street on Franklin where we might need to add two additional clarifiers. That's just part of the process where we settle out um, the solids and separate it from the clear water. And we're talking to the port now. We have a meeting tomorrow to continue to advance that effort. Um, and they've been collaborative so far in, in understanding our needs. When you talk about solids, how, how many trucks and loads of solid do you take out of there in a month or a um, day? Or? So one big trailer truck a day of solids. One truck a day. Yeah, and that's beneficial sol biosolids that goes to eastern Washington that's put on agricultural fields out there. That any, the any thought at all of utilizing Tenino's process about solids? What, what solids? I don't know. they got something new going on down there. They're always promoting... Yeah. what they're doing at their septic you know you know anything they about wanted it? to pro i think they were trying class to plan a. to produce yeah. okay. class a biosolids right okay somehow i mean it, it just the carbon footprint of driving to eastern washington every day would sure be reduced or something you know, if you first county has 
a production a class they, A product. Yeah, they right. have uh, pe pellets. So they do it so as well. So I mean, you, but that's our, sure. Uh, so it, you know, the green is all part of the picture. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of a thing. Yeah, uh, everything's a trade-off. So in order to get to class A biocells, we produce some called class B, which can be applied on agricultural fields, and the farmers love it, and and that's that's <laughs> program. But it does take trucking to get it over there. To produce class A, which is this next level, which that means that any of us could put it in our garden, you could touch it, there's just less regulations on it. That takes uh, a lot of energy because you need to heat it up, dry it out, and add that additional treatment. And so that's there what is, Pierce County's doing? Yeah. There is a carbon footprint and there is an energy Tyco. usage and, a, and an upgrade that's required. So the way we're doing with biosolids is that we're part of this very sustainable program with King County um, for our biosolids, but it's always been on the table that you know, when policy or policymakers are saying, yeah, let's take this more uh, to the next level, you know, we can evaluate what that looks like. It's certainly a very large investment. We're talking probably $15 million plus to go. Right Have now. you ever heard one of those presentations by the folks that are really opposed to this with the, I don't know, everything that's in it? Sure, sure. I mean, there's some. There's a scientist that has come up. Yeah, with one, yeah, so. and there's lots. I of just testing. wonder. It's quite a story. Yeah, and there's lots of testing, and you know, we make sure that it's uh, safe to the standards that have been determined by the government agencies that it is safe, right? We we check the metal content. We're we're checking all. So there's new awareness of PFAS and all these things in in the world. So when these testing requirements come out, we test to them. We're tracking all of that. Uh, it's certainly biosolids, just like our wastewater, is a product of our world and all the things that we use in it. Um, so, we had a situation when we were Commissioner Edwards and I were first when I was first on the board. He was there where it had nothing to do with law. It was some agricultural folks near the Nisqually River that were getting their biosolids from somewhere, somewhere else, um, Class B, and they're going to spread it. Yeah, and the, the people nearby got really up in arms arguing not that you know not that what you guys are doing but the proximity to the to the water source to the to the populations to the to the river it was yeah, all. yeah the impact on the squally river right was not the right place in western washington where it's wet it's gonna you know you could apply them then we could have a big rainstorm like okay go to eastern washington where it's dry right. and flat and there's no rivers but you shouldn't be doing this here we should be stopping them and we got involved in some limited degree, and I was just learning all, you know, what this all stuff was. Sure. It didn't really involve a lot because you guys had your own contracts and sending them out there, but I, it made me think, mm -hmm. what if Lot said, we don't want to spend so much money to, to, to truck them to, um, to, I don't know how the economics are, but let's just say yeah. you could save a little money by selling some of them locally mm -hmm. to the agricultural producers of Thurston County. And would you be getting that kind of heat would we be getting that kind of heat? I think those are the questions that, that Commissioner Edwards and I were asking ourselves, you know. Yeah. There's no biosolids application I'm aware of that's allowed in Thurston County. Okay. Right now. Um, but certainly when you apply biosolids in Class B, there's all of these requirements on agronomic rates and uptake of nitrogen and all of these things that needs to be a well-managed program. Okay. Um, if you produce a Class A product, that higher level of product you know you're making it you're removing those pathogens but the content of what's in it stays in there you know you don't like magically remove PFOS and uh, nitrogen all these things I mean, this is a product that would be beneficial to the garden adding some nitrogen and those type of things so uh, there, there's paths you know right now in our community cl class B is you know very viable uh, and it's being used in a beneficial way it's not being used right here but it is being used, reused. But those and those those numbers like balance out, meaning the the biosolid production of Western Washington wastewater treatment. We're not producing so much that it can't be used. Like, is there? You know what I mean? Oh like, yeah. You could be producing three times as much as Eastern Eastern Washington farmers could ever use, and then you'd have two thirds of it to figure out what to do with. And you're saying 100% basically we can send to Eastern Washington agricultural producers and they can use all of it. We've never had a limitation with regard to where it needs to go. We've been part of this program for a long time. We're like 1 20th of the size of the program. King County is the largest one. They actually 
started it and operate a lot of the most of it. So there's never been a, well, they can't take anymore because they manage their fields according to how much it can take for those agronomic rates. Um, if anything, it's just trucking over the mountains. And if there's a ice storm or there's something like that. It's kind of like the cost of doing business, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, but you said they actually, that they act, the, there's payment that happens from the farmer. They actually prefer that product. So they do pay for it. So, uh, my, so the individual farmer who wants to use class B, they are the ones who need to secure a permit. Yes. So it's not, it's not you, the provider who, Correct. because you're already permitted is the individual farmers who need to secure a permit to receive class B. Right. And that's why you stated in, in Thurston County to your knowledge, there's none. Yeah. Yeah. To my knowledge, yeah. um, that, uh, that there's no application. Not Certainly we don't. Yeah, class, no, B. class B. Is that class a, Class A is a different thing. Class A is yeah, class you go a to fertilizer. Yeah, you uh, yeah, Tagro, yeah. Soundgrow. That's biosolids, basically. Class it's, a. it's it's like fertilizer. It's Class A. Is that just because, like, I mean, I, we're probably getting outside your your area, but I mean, is there? Why not? I mean, we have agricultural lands in Thurston County. Why wouldn't? Is it not good to use in Western Washington, or is there? Why why wouldn't they use Class B biosolids? Uh, I, you know, this is, Art's well, got think, a lot well, more history on this. What you were talking about earlier. Art, do you want to come up here? I can. Did, I, can I can capture you know, while Art's coming up, I, I mean, we're working on a problem now out in uh, Smith Prairie mm -hmm. right now. Well, that was a, a big chicken so the, farm I think, and uh, mink farm and different product was, I think, put on that ground for a lot of years. And now it's showing up maybe as a problem. I think the... What you two mentioned earlier was the, uh, it's not that it isn't possible, but it's there's been significant public reaction to the two proposals for Class B applications in Thurston County that, since I've been here. And I think it's just been, that's dissuaded the proponents from pursuing it to its end. That's right. In our <laughs> case, the, they, they withdrew their application, didn't they? They withdrew the application. Um, and so, but that's for Class B biosolids. For Class A, when you do treat it to that higher standard, then the re regulatory requirements are much less. And I, I don't want to, we can talk about that at another briefing, but, um, or another time if you ever want to, but the, there are, if you reach that higher level or higher level of treatment, then some of the regulatory barriers are reduced. <laughs> and then the trick is now you have to also be getting rid of it for lack of, you know, finding the beneficial product. So, the engineering analysis when it goes when you go to class A is you have to look for a market now because then it's not economical. You spend all this money creating this product that people can buy and you can sell it for enough set, to get so now you have to sell it or you need to have stations where people can come buy it. You need to package it. You need to you need to just make sure there's a sustainable place to have that market. And that's where we're in right now a lot, our sustainable market and beneficial product is class <laughs> B. For a while, uh Purse County used to just Give bags away of Tagro. Right, right. I mean, just show up with your in the weekend and just. But that was load. costing a lot of money to produce it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's a product. They, I think, at that point, I, the, the county wanted to make sure that was a class A, and right, and they needed to get rid of it because it was the production of such thing. Right, and so yeah, so all those equations that go into is class B, class A, all that stuff, and certainly with the board, you know, we can revisit that, and we do from time to time. Every few years, we come up and we we talk about it. Well, Tonino, from, I haven't heard him talk about it in a year and a half or so, but they were seemed to be thinking that they could build up their plant, take basically waste, like they could basically take outside stuff, and then they were considering trying to take sep, um, septage, you know, basically septic tank pumpers and, and utilize that on their plant, which... And somehow the class A product that they could yeah, produce is would, that class D would help product them to defray that. Well, it's, just, it's you know, as Matt can tell you, he was talking about upsetting a plant, big plant like Lot, a smaller plant like Tanino. It, you know, it would be more vulnerable if we accepted a load of material that that um, you know whatever it would be that would upset a plant. So those are the things they have to try to manage. And I know when they've asked, they asked us years ago, or they were talking about accepting septic tank waste in their plant that was a big kind of a red flag it's like you know we're not telling you what to do but that you need to be really cautious if that's what you want to do <laughs> we don't take that anymore right didn't we stop doing it yeah so we take it from the partners but no commercial 
uh, septics. We that, did, but now we don't, and, and, and their options are, with, are Pierce and Lewis County, if I remember right. Yes, yeah. Um, pumpers. Yeah, if you're a private just, hauler in we Thurston. We would just get, and all of a sudden you get inundated, and because of our really low permit limits, it was just hard and it would upset the biology if you get some slug loads of things. Also, because that septage, that's been sitting there for sometimes six to eight years, you know, and it's got the accumulation of metals and it's got these other things and it kind of hits. And it's but like we it's also are, uh, if, there's an, if there's an emergency or there's something, we can certainly take it. It's just, we, our practice is to not to take it right away. Two forty-eight. Uh, <laughs> you got an interesting topic. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I'm glad you're engaged. Yeah. Let's see. Let's see if I can get to the results of the study here. So, uh, so capacity. So when we looked at reclaimed water and that base case of producing all these plants, so we looked at that. But a new option uh, was brought up by our consultant, and something we had been thinking about for a while was we're doing such good treatment at the Bud Inlet Treatment Plant. Can we actually just focus on doing better and better treatment because we know that gives us capacity for growth. So the reclaimed water option, we went down that, that path uh, of multiple satellite plants and infiltration sites. We know that it's a challenge to manage a decentralized plant. You have extra staff, you have security, you have chemicals, you have screening, you have pumping, you have all these things that you have to double up on a remote site. The other thing that's interesting is that you can be limited on reclaimed water production itself because you know, a lot of flow coming to your main plant, but you sink a plant out here and you want to produce reclaimed water more, you have to wait until you actually have more wastewater flow that actually gets to that location. So it can be flow limiting. Uh, and then those sites that we purchased for infiltration, there is an estimated range of how much you can infiltrate over time. Uh, and we're talking like 1 million gallon per day to maybe 3 million gallons per day. And we've done some additional studies and mm -hmm. most of those are really on the lower end of that infiltration rate. So you need to connect a bunch of those sites in order to make a long-term 2050 plan. Also that extensive purple pipe network, we have uh, irrigation kind of spidering out to all of these sites. Hasn't really played out that way. What's really developed for irrigation is when we have our main force main, that's where the irrigation kind of gets connected to. So this, this larger network of, of a reclaimed pipes just didn't materialize in the same way as originally developed. So that reclaimed water option, you can kind of see here, there's this purple line all the way down. We own a site down our called our South Deschutes property. That one site can take a lot of that infiltration. So if we want a good long-term plan through 2050, what the reclaimed water option looks like to produce more is continuing to expand out in Martin Way when flow develops, but putting a large pipeline all the way down to the South Deschutes and, and doing that site. So that's about $115 million, and that was two years ago dollars. Um, so that's an eight-mile pipeline. So you could do it. It just, it, it's a lot, and you have to kind of connect some of these smaller sites along the way. But this option of enhanced treatment uh, was really intriguing because you could further reduce nitrogen by adding additional treatment steps even below what we're doing now. And there's technology out there that's proven to help get there. So to illustrate what that looks like is if I take a given amount of, of, of water that we treat, clean water, and this is certainly not to scale, but I wanted to show the difference in colors. So you have yellow is how much nitrogen is left over. And remember lots regulated on our total pounds of nitrogen at the end of the day, that number is not changing. So as more people connect to the system, that total needs to stay that the same. So how do we do that? Well, we add new technology. So for that given amount of clean water, we can drive that nitrogen back down by enhancing treatment. So you get the nitrogen lower. So that means I have more capacity to grow. So I can actually add more water to the system and get to that same end result. And that's really what we're talking about with enhanced treatment is treating to lower levels and still meeting our permit limit and having continued connections to the system. So where we ended up in our master plan was, is actually a combination of both of these options. So you can do enhanced treatment at a more cost-effective way, focusing on the butt inlet treatment plant, but you can also expand reclaimed water. And you can expand reclaimed water because the Martin Way facility and our butt inlet treatment plant, the reclaimed water plant, actually have capacity to expand. They were built that way. Uh, and then the pipelines itself have capacity to expand. The Hawks Prairie infiltration site has capacity and, and you can infiltrate more out there, actually, is what the studies show. 
and then we can connect with when the partner jurisdictions need that reclaimed water. As opposed to building our own site and siting a new treatment plant and building infiltration sites, um, we can build it when the time comes, when that demand develops. Well, like out at Jubilee, do you use that purple pipe to water their golf course? I believe the city of Lacey may use, if that's reclaimed water, so that's the city of Lacey that is the purveyor of that water. So Did they um, get it from you? Yeah, if they use reclaimed water, that's that's from us. We lose our meeting. Yeah, we produce it, and then the city of Lacey is responsible for that. Oh, should I? Is it okay? Yeah. Oh. Sorry, I couldn't see. Um, Turn off the lights. Good. Yeah. <laughs> so we might have ended the zoo, the Zoom though. Yeah, but the live stream is going. Yeah. So. so so yeah, lots the producer of it, but each of the cities end up they're the ones that connect with the end user. So if Jubilee uses it, then they would get that from the city. Of I mean, I don't know that they do. I mean, it's a golf course. And uh, I'm well. not aware, though, of that golf course using it. Why wouldn't they? It's probably it's just economics right of where the city of Lacey, or, you know, has determined where those pipelines are. The and last mile. <laughs> to get it out to a site, you'd have to pump it and put in the infrastructure, that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, so, and this is, this is the last slide. So, uh, as far as outcomes then, so coming up with a strategy then to uh, do better and better treatment at the budding and treatment plant, but continue to produce reclaimed water, what that gets us is cost effectiveness because we don't have to have that additional staffing, the extensive pipelines for infiltration sites. Those infiltration sites that have been purchased that I showed you on that screen, we can actually start surplusing those and selling those off. And then we can use those funds to buy property, like we're talking about, near the Bud Inlet treatment plant that we know we would need to expand near there. Didn't you do something like that up on the Deschutes up past Tumwater or something? Uh, yeah, so we own property in the Deschutes Valley there, in the Brewery Valley. So that was one of the sites that was purchased to be a future treatment plant. So this plan has showed us that we would be assuming our board adopts it, we would be surplusing that property because it's no longer needed for a plant down there. Those are the buildings that I was just went to look at that I've talked about in my commissioner's report yesterday. Yeah. Looked at those buildings right. for the first time. Right. And then it's adaptable because rather than, you know, build all this infrastructure and then have to find a need to infiltrate, we actually can connect with the partner jurisdictions on when when the jurisdictions need water. So uh, they see Olympia, Tumwater, you know, for example, Tumwater comes up with some water mitigation strategy and they want to put their own infiltration site similar to what Lacey and Olympia did. We know what we would do. We know we'd expand our butt inlet facility and, and that's a benefit to lot for capacity. But to go ahead and do that now is just a little bit premature. Um, so we're, we can adapt when the time comes. There's public values as far as using reclaimed water as a resource, so we're not. We're, that's still very much part of our picture. And one of the main things about the highly managed plan, the just-in-time planning, is all about flexibility. Because what's shown us over the last 20 years since the original plan was developed is you don't really know what's going to happen. Regulations can get tighter in this way. You know, um, biosolids regulations come down the line, and we know what we would do if we did that. We know we'd go to maybe Class A. We know what we would do in these, all of these various situations, and we want to maintain that flexibility. So we're going to have a community forum February 27th. We're going to be explaining a lot more about this, getting more in depth, uh, and uh, and then be going out and sharing this information. Where is that going to take place at? That's going to be on Zoom. Where? On Zoom. Oh. Online. <laughs> yeah. Commissioner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then we have a SEPA process, and then ultimately we'll ask our lot board to adopt the plan. When you do have a Zoom uh, event like that, though, at least it's available for those that couldn't be there for that moment in time, and they can catch it next week. Or right. Whatever. You know, so typically, like what we do for our board meetings is we have the, the presentation running in our, in our main boardroom, and people can show up if they don't want to, you know, sure. do it that way. but. We just found the engagement on Zoom to make it easy for people on a, something like this where they could add questions in and we could field questions in a, in a different way. So that's what we found effective. Yep, normal people. <laughs> <laughs> if we get a lot of feedback that we should do it in person, we could do another no. one too. Yeah, part of it is getting out here and explaining it too. So.
Last minute Great questions. Presentation. I've got to head off to the in person okay. meeting. Thanks now. for the help, Art. The yeah. last in slide person. in our packet is this graph. That was a hidden slide. Okay. Uh, it, it's not, it, I can explain it. It's basically a more technical way of looking at capacity. Mm -hmm. I just thought it might be interesting to the Yeah, board. I mean, if you wanted to see it real quick. Uh, you may be the only one that has that. Oh, no, we, we oh. all of us have. I've got it right here. Oh, you're the only one that has yeah. Oh. Well, if you wanted to know, see this little star right here? It's an updated uh, slide, I think. Uh -huh. That star is where we're operating now, just a little bit below our permit limit of three milligrams per liter. So this is nutrient concentration. So if you take this point in time, let's just say we're permitted here, and we're able to get our nutrient concentration to two, you see that line right there, the delta, the gap between three and two, you get 5.8 million gallons per day of capacity just by going the concentration down a little bit. So to put that in perspective, um, one million gallons per day of capacity is like 7,000 connections. So, you know, just shy of 20,000 people. So you're talking about 13,000 connections or something. So, you know, it makes a lot of sense to do it this way. 20,000 people, put, that uh, is a whole mile, city. mile, $100 million plus pipeline to a site and infiltrate, you know, that's really why um, that the 2050 plan makes sense. How is many to focus connections on do you have? Six, uh, shy of 60,000 right now. So you'd be a, like, like a 25% increase sort of yeah. ish. I mean, in a theoretical way of yeah. getting there, but yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Great, well, thank you so much. Um, with that, it is three o'clock and we are adjourned. Thanks for having me.